Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Twin blasts hit counter-terrorism department police station in Pakistan's Swat district. jaish e mohammed operating freely in Pakistan. And Pakistani terrorist attack Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir plan to sabotage G20 events. Repeated terror attacks are on the rise in Pakistan in recent months. In the latest incident, at least 17 people were killed as an apparent suicide bombing ripped through a police headquarters in Pakistan. Two explosions went off inside the counter-terrorism office in Nadan, Swat district. The area used to be a stronghold of the Pakistani Taliban. A report. Twin deadly explosions rocked a counter-terrorism office in northwest Pakistan. The bombing claimed the lives of at least 17 individuals, majority of whom were police officers, and injured more than 40 others. The blast occurred at Kabal police station in Swat Valley, an area that was previously controlled by Islamist militants before a military operation in 2009. No group or individual took responsibility for the attack, but in recent months, the Pakistani Taliban have claimed similar attacks after ending the ceasefire with the Pakistani government. او د مینګورې د عوام د سیدو ډیر زیات قربانی د چې لکه اسپتال کې دومره رشو چې هر سړی سملاستو وی زمانه وی نه Since the beginning of the year two attacks on large police bases have been linked to the Pakistani Taliban Pakistan Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif originally classified the bombings as a suicide strike on Twitter Later that night he posted an update in which he stated that the nature of the bomb is being probed. Earlier in January, a suicide bomber detonated his vest in a mosque inside a police compound in the northwestern city of Peshawar. More than 80 officers were killed as the building collapsed. The next month, five people were killed when a TTP suicide squad raided a police compound in Karachi, resulting in an hours-long shootout. The TTP have long targeted law enforcement officers who they accuse of conducting extrajudicial killings. They have always been, in my opinion, Pakistan's biggest security threat. The problem is the security state, uh, you know, is focused towards uh, India. And the way they, you know, always, uh, you look, remember Bangladesh also, they believe that religion is the uh, panacea to all things. To corruption, to uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, misgovernance, malgovernance, call it what you will, uh, to ethnic uh, strife, which is what uh, uh, the TTP is. It's essentially, you know, Pashtuns uh, in uh, uh, Pakistani Pashtuns. So this has been a problem. It has always been the core problem of the Pakistani state. But because the security state justifies itself in opposition to India, they could never acknowledge the TTP was the biggest threat. Uh, that obviously now has to change. Pakistan has seen a dramatic uptick in terrorist attacks in the past few months. Islamabad says that offensives are being launched from Afghan soil. It's an allegation that Kabul denies. Pakistan has long failed to take appropriate action to combat terrorism within and outside the country. The country is now facing the consequences of its inaction and those suffering the most continue to be Pakistani citizens. Terrorism is back to haunt Pakistan. In a concerning development, United Nations proscribed terror outfit Jaish e Mohammed has been seen openly collecting funds in Pakistan's space shower, raising alarm bells about the resurgence of extremist group in the country. A report. The UN-designated terrorist group jaish e Mohammed has been spotted openly collecting funds in Pakistan's Peshawar. 
This has sparked concerns in the country regarding the return of extremist groups, especially since the country was removed from Financial Action Task Force's grey list. The Jaish fund collecting is evident throughout the country, including in Pakistan's Punjab, Pakistan-occupied Jammu and Kashmir and other locations. This comes at a time when Pakistani military openly threatened India it is capable of taking the battle into enemy's territory. Kashmir na kabhi Bharat ka atootang raha hai aur na rahega. Army chief ne command samalne ke baad pehla dora line of control ka kiya aur wazeh alfaz mein pegham diya ke afaj Pakistan is mulk ke چپے چپے کا دفاع کرنے کی صلاحیت رکھتی ہے اور اگر ضرورت پڑی تو وی کین ٹیک دس بیٹل ان ٹو دی اینیمیز ٹیریٹری اگر کسی مس کیلکولیشن یا غلط فہمی کی وجہ سے ہندوستان کوئی مہم مہم جوئی کرنے کا سوچتا ہے ارادہ کرتا ہے تو عوامی حوصلے اور عوام کی سپورٹ کے ساتھ افواج پاکستان اس کو بھرپور جواب دیں گی اس میں کوئی شک نہیں ہونا چاہیے Hundreds of Twitter users who witnessed the incident were seen debating it on the social media network. After the tweets got viral, one of them deactivated his account. This is not an isolated event, as other users pointed out that fundraising for extremist groups occurs in other places as well. These terrorist groups, though designated by global organizations, are openly backed by Pakistani security personnel. The ease with which these groups can openly gather funds raises questions about the Pakistani government's ability to crack down on terrorist activities. It is very difficult to engage with a neighbor uh, who practices cross-border terrorism uh, against us. Uh, we have always said that they have to deliver on their commitment uh, not to encourage, sponsor and carry out cross-border terrorism. The FATF stated earlier this year in a severe message to Islamabad that Pakistan's efforts in combating terror financing is being closely reviewed. The remarks are noteworthy in light of Hezbollah Mujahideen commander Sayyid Salawuddin's public appearance in Pakistan back in February. Pakistan had to undergo a long scrutiny process to get itself off the list. The country was added to the grey list in the FATF plenary meeting in Paris in 2018. This was the third time when Islamabad was added to the list. According to SSRI reports, Islamabad may deny systematically supporting terrorists, but it exploits systematic flaws to support terrorists who not only engage in terrorism within Pakistan, but also expand their terror activities in other countries such as India. As the Mumbai attacks in 2008, Pathan Court and Uri attacks in 2016, and Pulbama in 2019. There had been no coordinated action taken against those who were involved in and funded the Mumbai attacks. Pakistan anti terror campaign is a farce. It is designed to give the impression of progress, but behind the scenes, nothing has changed. In reality, the nation continues to be haven for terrorists. Only token efforts were taken to remove the nation from the FADF's grey list. Moving on. After months of peace and tranquility in the Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistan has yet again perpetrated a nefarious terrorist activity in Poonch that took lives of five Indian Army soldiers and grievously injured another. This comes at a time when India is hosting one of the major events of the year, G20, and chairing another event of international importance, SEO Summit. Baffled with India's prosperity and international fame, Pakistan is trying to sabotage a G20 event scheduled to take place in Srinagar next month. We have a report. The recent terrorist attack on an Indian army truck at Bhimbargali of the Jammu Punch National Highway that took the lives of five Indian soldiers was a dastardly attempt to again destabilize peace in the Kashmir Valley. An offshoot of Jaish Muhammad, PAFF, has claimed responsibility for the heinous attack 
on the Indian security forces. The Pakistani terrorist outfit has even posted pictures on a social media platform kindling a dead propaganda that terrorism in Kashmir is still far from over. On the peaceful afternoon of 20th April at around 3 p.m., the army truck was ambushed by allegedly five to seven terrorists. They fired indiscriminately on the soldiers, killing five and seriously injuring another. As per sources, they later blasted the truck's fuel tank with an IED and decamped with the weapons of the martyred soldiers. The terrorist attack was purported at a time when India is hosting the biggest event of the year, G20, and another event, the SEO meeting of foreign ministers, is just around the corner. Pakistan is one of the members of SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. If we are conducting an international event like G20, and if the other party comes or doesn't come, we must not stop our activities. I'm now referring to Pakistan, the, uh, what has happened in Kashmir. We must carry out our activities on the POK relentlessly, whether we have to do a surgical strike or whatever it is. Let the meetings continue. Let the foreign minister of Pakistan be here or not here, immaterial. And this should be told to him on his face and it should be told to the world. Let it be very transparent. Let it know, be known to the world that this is the doctrine of India and we abide by it. Weeks ago, Pakistan had expressed its condemnation against India's decision to host G20 Tourism Working Group meeting in Srinagar. India has also scheduled two meetings of a consultative forum on youth affairs Y20 in Leh and Srinagar that has further discontented the neighbor. The terrorist attack in Punch can be seen as a premonition of rising terror activities in Kashmir Valley. To further corroborate this presentiment, a POK activist Amzad Ayub Mirza has revealed that around 30 terrorists have been deployed in the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir region to infiltrate the Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir. This is the Jammu Kashmir me gusbat ke liye 30 terrorists jo hai wo POJK ki side pe deploy kar diye gaye hain. Ye mere sources se ye information aayi hai. ये पॉइंट्स जो है इनके ऊपर सिक्योरिटी ग्रिड को एक्टिवेट करें मजबूत करें और इन पे नजर रखें। After the horrifying terrorist attack in Punch, the security forces have already received input regarding the presence of six to seven terrorists in Rajouri Punch. The coming and recce operations have been further intensified in Kashmir. After the input, in a major breakthrough of investigations, a local has reportedly admitted having provided logistical support to the Pakistani terrorists for nearly three months. The way in which the attack was coordinated, the use of China manufactured bullets, grenades, sticky IDs, and possible deployment of a sniper largely points towards Pakistan's ISI involvement with the terrorist groups and China. Although India has always been party to diplomatic solutions and peaceful resolutions for any issues arising with her neighbors, Pakistan takes cross-border terrorism as the only route. The Punch terror attack is a grim reminder for India that Pakistan would continue to purport cross-border terrorism and Indian security forces cannot keep their guard down even when the ceasefire has been diplomatically agreed upon between the two parties at LOC. The security and intelligence agencies have been put on high alert and India is all prepared for holding the G20 event in Srinagar next month. Pakistan, on the other hand, may have to prepare itself for another Balakot or surgical strike-like incident. Moving on. An independent faith engagement advisor to the UK government, Colin Bloom has recently published a report regarding diverse religious communities in UK and how are very few elements from these communities 
especially Sikh and Islamic, incite violence and intimidation among their own community and others. The report has been recommended by the British authorities that suggests how the country can tackle such activities of religious extremism. Our colleague Ravi Khandilwal had an online interview with Colin Bloom on the issue. Here are some excerpts. Listen in. Uh, since you said you know that, that uh, in UK you have a diverse uh, diverse society uh, in the country, and your findings uh, you know give us a very uh, positive aspects of this diversity uh, within the country. But you know, there are some negative aspects also. Uh, you have mentioned in your report, you know, uh, for example, you know the, the Islamists and uh, the Sikh extremism uh, you know, flourishing in the country. So, can you please elaborate on these negative aspects which you have highlighted in your report? So, the idea that faith is dying out, that people are less interested in uh, religion or, or, or spiritual things is, is a myth. It's very, very different uh, to what it used to be perhaps 50 years ago. Now, that does mean that we do have some challenges uh, that we have to face. And of course, um, you know, it's well known that Islamist extremism and Islamist terrorism um, is the biggest faith-based challenge that, uh, that we have. But again, I, I point out in the report that by far the biggest victims of Islamist extremism are Muslims. And the vast majority of Muslims in the UK are kind, generous, warm, friendly, decent people. But they're being let down by a very tiny minority who are uh, uh, who are causing these problems. Now, the issue with um, the British Sikh community is that the overwhelming majority of them are the nicest, kindest and most decent people that we have in the UK. They're generous. Uh, they are they are you know, they are hardworking. They are overrepresented in academia and, and in, you know, uh, and in high paying jobs. They are they are very, very good people. I say that they are the best of British. Um, a tiny minority that uh, are amongst them are, are very aggressive, are very, um, uh, are very loud uh, and and are not representative of the majority British Sikh community. And in our evidence gathering for the report, a number of um, a, a very large number of British Sikhs uh, gave evidence to say that they felt that something needed to be done to tackle the rise of what they call extremist behaviour within their own community. And as we were doing, and as I was doing the um, evidence gathering and, and looking at um, looking at this 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 problem, it really um, I think opened my eyes and opened the eyes of many of my colleagues to just how big the problem is, where we have got as I say, a very small minority, but they're very loud, very aggressive, and they're using um, coercive tactics and sometimes subversive um, behaviour to get their to get their point across. Um, and um, and unfortunately, that is what we're seeing. So we are seeing a very small group of people using aggressive tactics to try and uh, encourage all Sikhs to believe what they believe. Um, about whether it's a state of Khalistan or whether it's uh, whether it's um, uh, other issues, and so um, you know, I'm I'm keen. I'm very pleased to say that in the last few years, the British government have been increasing its uh, awareness of this problem, and they are um, and they're beginning to tackle it. But my report is the first, I think, to really lay out in very clear terms, which is evidence based that this is a problem that needs to be addressed. And let's not forget that there are still a number of Sikh extremist and terrorist organizations that are prescribed as terrorist organizations, whether that's Baba Khalsa or whether that's the ISYF. It's now deprescribed in the UK, the ISYF, but Baba Khalsa is still prescribed as a terrorist organization. And membership of those organizations is a criminal offense. So we need to make sure that the government are doing as much as they possibly can to crack down on this, these extremist um, uh, fringe elements of what is otherwise an incredibly kind, generous and tolerant community. Mr. Colin, uh, you might have noticed, you know, a very frequent uh, protest outside the Indian High Commission in London. You know, uh, and some of the protests are 
uh, were also very violent. Do you believe that you know such kind of activities uh, by Sikh ex uh, extremists in in UK uh, are impacting the relations between the UK and the Indian government? I don't. I'm. I, I hope not. Is would be my answer. I hope not. Look, I am. I am. I consider it an enormous privilege that I live in a country which is tolerant and free and we have the liberty to go and protest at whatever we don't want. In fact, it's the same in India. People can protest in India um, without, uh, you know, without fear of being arrested. But when that protest becomes violent, when that protest includes criminal damage and when it involves coercing others to behave in a criminal way, that's where it crosses the line. I, so to answer your question directly, I hope it doesn't damage the relations between the UK and India. We have some of the strongest ties, a great deal of affection, and obviously a shared history that goes back many hundreds of years. And I, you know, I, hope, that, uh, I hope that continues, whether that's with the British Hindu community, the British Sikh community, the British Muslim community, whoever it may be, um, uh, we have to continue to build on those things that bind us together rather than would divide us. Mr. Colin, my last question to you is, you know, that since you have done a research uh, in the UK, but don't you believe that, you know, such kind of uh, activities are now growing up in, in Europe, in America and other parts of the world? Uh, a very recent report, uh, you know, which is a leaked document, uh, which says, you know, that ISIS is going very strong in Afghanistan and which poses a strong challenge uh, to the Europe and the and the American society. But perhaps be a bit helpful to your question. Um, very often issues that happen overseas will be played out on the streets of the United Kingdom. Um, and that's partly because we have such, as I said at the beginning of this interview, we have such a diverse community that live in the UK. Um, I think that's our strength, um, but it sometimes means that, uh, you know, international, um, uh, um, international uh, issues that, that come up, whether that's between two different countries or two different regions, um, will often be exaggerated and played out on the streets of the UK. Same thing happens in Canada, the same thing happens in the United States, wherever there is, um, uh, you know, diverse communities that come from all over the world, sometimes some of the, some of the luggage, some of the baggage is brought with, uh, is brought with them. Um, I think on balance, we're still stronger because we have that diversity, but it's something that will require education, tolerance, respect, um, and those those British values that we all um, talk about of democracy, liberty, justice, and tolerance, they need to be embraced by everybody. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks for talking. Thank you. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.